Matthew chapter 6, we've made it as far as verse 25. Uh, this perspective from the king about his kingdom. Uh, there's much to see and much to comprehend through these chapters. And so I, I pray that you're looking through them, you're, you're thinking about them, that they're kind of catching you and, and making you uh, wonder what's going on. You know, uh, to this morning's, one of this morning's topics is worry. Anybody have trouble with that? You know, anybody <coughs> ever have that you know jesus catches you out of the blue here he says therefore i say to you do not worry about your life what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body what you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? You know, if you're reading the King James Version, it says, take no thought for your life. Don't, don't be overly concerned about these material things in your life. Don't, don't make them bigger than they are. You know, because... It doesn't mean that we're, we're supposed to live a careless and carefree life. But what it's saying is we are forbidden. That's a tough word, right? We are forbidden to worry, to carry our problems anywhere than other than, than to the foot of the cross, other than to our Lord. Because it's easy to become distressed perplexed about simple things simple life issues and we forget that he who saved us also still cares for us he's the god of all creation he he's got it all under control yes it's not under your control it's under his control but he's got it, you know. I have been, in my short little life, I have been given great opportunity to exercise this thing. Don't worry. And I got to tell you, I have failed time and time again. You know, when we, uh, when we had our little wreck and I stopped working at age 41, never to work again. And... You think about, I just lost my job. I just lost all my insurance. I just lost my ability to do this. We lost our car. We did this. We, and, you know, you can get yourself, <coughs> and I managed to, all worked up in a big fret. But then you look back over the last 18 or 20 years how the Lord has provided, how the Lord has granted, how the Lord has kept us. And... It hasn't been stressful. It's been him doing it, you know. So Jesus looks at you and he says, stop your worrying. Can it get any simpler than that? Just stop it. Knock it off, you know. There's, of course, you need food and you need drink and you need clothing. And, you know, how's this life all going to work out? A lot of the world can honestly say, well, what else is there to do? You know, you got to worry about these things. You got to take care of them. You got to do all of that stuff. And that's such a worldly perspective. <clears throat> and that's part of what the Lord's dealing with here. Don't become like the world where all they see is these physical things. But there's more to life. There's more to what's going on here than just these things, than just the material stuff. Have your eyes become so darkened to reality that all you see is the physical? That all you see is the next day. Oh, I got this bill coming up and we got this thing going on and we're, we were going to do that. And, and suddenly <coughs> you're overwhelmed by concern for the simple things of life. We're forgetting that we're created, that we are loved and cared for and greatly honored to have a father 
who oversees, who watches over, who supplies, who gives. And I always find it interesting, you know. He's going to go through here and he's going to say, Oh, you of little faith. Oh, you of little faith. And how many times that has been me? Because faith is never about the amount of faith you have. Oh, I need more faith. I don't think you do. I think you simply need to engage the faith that God has given you. You know, faith in the Bible is, is the backwards thing. Because Jesus points to a little child and he goes, oh, if you just have faith like that. He doesn't point to us adults and go, man, if you just have faith like Dick over here, everything would be great. No, that's the, act, that's the opposite of, because little children... They have great faith. You know, they'll, they'll run off a, a table and jump knowing that dad's going to catch them, even if dad isn't ready, you know. They just have this absolute faith. <clears throat> Whereas we adults, we start to bring in all of our wisdom and all of our knowledge all of this, well, it's never really worked out like that for me, so I've got to take this, I've got to change that, I've got to do this. He says in verse 26, he says, take a look at nature for a minute. Take a look at the rest of creation. Look at the birds. They, you don't see them out there with little harvesters sowing, you know, or harvesting or putting up in barns, even though, you know, in, in our household, there's a barn or two for the birds full of seed, you know. You, you don't see them doing that. But you always see birds working. I mean, it fascinates me. I walk around our community, and every morning... I see birds, and they're fluttering here, and they're going there, and they're, you know, there's been a grain truck down the road, and of course, when it stopped, it dumped out a little grain, and all the birds know, hey, it's over here, you know? And you'll see them march through the yards. There'll be a line of these blackbirds, and they're just walking across the, it's like they're searching out for every bug, every, anything that moves so they can eat it. They're constantly busy. He's not saying you should be like a bird and just open your mouth and say, Lord, fill it up here. And just sit there. He's not saying that. But he's saying, I'll take care of you. Through my creation, through the strength I gave you, through the intellect, <coughs> through your ability, through all of these things, you will have what you need. God knows they have needs. God looks at those birds. Man, they're going to need some food, you know. And God provides for them. Man, there's grain in the fields for them, right? There's worms in the earth and little bugs crawling around on the grass and there's flies in the air. They are sustained through those things. And Jesus expects us to live above the level of you know, natural creation, if you will, above the animal level. Most of us have replaced God as our supply with the idea that our bank account is our supply. My savings are my supply. My job is my supply. And that's not a real smart move. Sure, we have talent, we have ability, we trade our time and talent and energy for money. But that's short-sighted. That is of little faith. Because God, as your father, and you as his child, he expects you to rely upon him. <laughs> but we've become covetous, haven't we? We are always desiring more and better. I don't know about you. I read through the Exodus sometimes. You know, Israel, you know, here's this couple of million people out in this desert, and every day, <coughs> manna falls from heaven. 
and they go out there and they collect their manna. Every day, water is gushing out of that rock, and they can go over and get their drink and feed their animals and do all of this stuff. But after two days, three days, I'm tired of this manna. I mean, I realize it's life. I realize it's everything I need for health and life. But man, you remember the garlic we had back in Egypt? You ever get that way? I find myself, I'm very much that way. Still complaining. You know, the only one that doesn't complain about garlic is Tyra, and she still complains about it because she remembers it. You know? He says in verse 27, Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to your stature? Now here it seems to be talking about, can you add one cubit, the length from your elbow to the tip of your finger, can you add 18 inches to your stature? I've been trying. Right? My stature goes clear around, so you know. But it may also mean, can you add days to your life? Can you add, you know, a time period to this thing we call life? <laughs> Worry is an issue. It never adds to your life. It only steals from your life. Now we Christians, you know, especially us mature Christians, we've been Christians long enough to know that we don't worry. We're just really concerned about this issue, you know. I really have a burden for this thing that's going on in my life, you know. I have this cross that I've got to carry. <laughs> right? But the results are the same. <clears throat> You're dragging around something that only makes your life harder and shorter. It's a proven fact. Worry steals from you, from your life. So in verse 28, so why do you worry? Well, you could stop right there and ask yourself several questions there. So why? Do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all of his glory was arrayed like one of these. Again, look at creation. Look at grass. Look at flowers. Look at all these things that pop up naturally. You know, you campers, you think about that. You go up in the hills in, in spring, and here's all these wild flowers. It's beautiful. And you go up a month later, and they're all just dry little sticks. You're thinking, what a waste. What happened to that? Well, they have a purpose. Their purpose is to be beautiful for a season, and then their purpose is to become tinder, you know, fire, grass, something to be harvested. Everything in creation is totally and completely trusting in God except us, except humans. The cows aren't walking around going, oh man, wonder where my next spoonful of hay is gonna come from, you know. They, they're not freaked out like that, we are. Man, man's issues all start because we try to live without being dependent upon God for everything. We expect us to take, you know, pull, your step up, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps and, you know, be a man and walk out there and do this thing. Well, that's all great in the Lord. That's not great by yourself. That's wrong instruction. We are the highest of God's creation. We are the most loved the most, most cared for, the most watched over of all of God's creation, and yet we are the most stubborn and we are the most foolish of all of God's creation. We're the slowest to believe. We're the slowest to just relax and say, you know, God's got me. It's okay. It's going to be all right. We have a God who, who allows us to call him Abba, 
father, daddy, and we don't trust daddy. So in verse 30, he says, Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? If he controls all of nature, and it all works, every year it seems to work, every year it just clicks on and on and on, how come we can't trust him that that's going to happen in our lives? Jesus would say in another place, if you had faith like a mustard seed, not the size of a mustard seed, but faith like a mustard seed, isn't it interesting that a mustard seed has faith? You plant it in the soil in a certain condition, <coughs> and the darkness and the moisture and all of this stuff work inside of that seed, and it knows, oh, roots down, sprout up, this goes. If we just had faith like that, we could move mountains. But we believers struggle with faith because it's one of those unknown quantities. I can't see it coming. Sometimes I don't understand how it's going to work the way he says it's going to work. Faith must be used. It must be invested. And we believers, we don't have faith in faith. I hear it all the time on Facebook. Oh, just have faith. And everything will work out. Really? Have faith in what? Faith in faith? I have faith that my faith is going to be good and that faith is going to work. No, faith is, is reliant upon who your faith is in. What your faith is in. Is your faith in your abilities? Or is your faith in his ability? Who he is, you know? We have to train our faith to be directed towards and completely trust in our God, our Father. So Jesus, he says in verse 31, therefore, there's one of them big swinging doors, because of all of these things, therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear, for after all these things the Gentiles seek, the heathen seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. Jesus is comparing the household of faith, you and I, with the rest of the heathen world that pays no attention to him. And he says, you know what the difference is between you guys? You all have those needs. I know that even the Gentiles, even the non-believers need these things but you're God's kids. You're the love of my life. And you're not trusting me to do those things. We're to know better. And our knowing is to affect our actions and our activities. We're to know that we are so loved. God so loved the world. Oh, that he gave Jesus. And that's amazing. But I don't know if he so loves me that he's going to get me through this next year. That he's going to get me through this sickness. That he's going to get me through this trouble. I don't know if he so loves me. Oh, it says in Romans that if he freely gave you Christ on the cross, he will freely give you all things that pertain to life. Huh. <laughs> But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. But seek first. As a believer, our attitude is different than the rest of the world. We expect God to take note of us. We expect God to take care of us. We expect our Father to be our Father. Right? And so we must learn to put his kingdom first, his righteousnesses first. 
And then we discover that he meets us in those places, in those needs, in those times. What a testimony it is if you ever have the privilege of seeing somebody that absolutely walks this out. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be added to you. You see, I had the privilege of growing up as a new Christian under a guy named Rick Brown. This was his life verse. Seek first. His radio ministry was called that. His TV ministry was called that. You know, all of those things. I watched Rick for years do things that were impossible. We'd have these board meetings and we'd sit around and talk and we don't know how we're going to afford this, but I feel like the Lord wants us to start this radio station. So we're just going to dive in and buy a radio station and do this. And I'm sitting there looking at him going, how's he? How does he make those decisions? How does he know? Well, what if God doesn't show up? What, you know, and I'm back here being me. And he's up there just marching along. God wants his word out there for everybody to hear. So naturally, we got to have a radio station to do that. And he just walked out and did it. And you're like, oh, well, how'd that work out? It still works out. He wants us on TV. Mark, set up a TV thing and let's go be on TV. How? How are we going to afford that? We can't. We got, we got nothing. And he did it. Oh, we got to build a new sanctuary. You know, this one that just holds 400 people ain't enough. So we're going to build one that holds 1,000 people. Well, what's that going to cost? I don't know, like $2 million. How are we going to do that? I don't know. Just dive out and do it. And every time he did it, God would be right there and meet him. And I'm like, that is crazy. You know why it worked? Because he sought first the kingdom of God. All of these things were for God and for his glory and for his kingdom and for his righteousness and everything else just poured in. <laughs> you know, my life verse is becoming Hebrews eleven six. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. Most of us are there. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Most of us fall off the boat there. He's a rewarder. If you're just going after him, seeking him, seeking his face, seeking his good, his righteousness, his glory, he rewards that. So verse 34, therefore do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about its own things sufficient for the day is its own trouble worrying about anything doesn't help today and it doesn't help tomorrow if anything it robs us of our effectiveness our ability to do anything about it it's been said that we are all busy being crucified between two thieves the regrets of yesterday and the worries of tomorrow. Are those two thieves robbing your life? Taking your life? Now it's right to have a plan. It's right to prepare for tomorrow. But it is a sin to worry about tomorrow. <laughs> Three words in this section I think stand out to me. The word faith. We are to be trusting that God is caring for us. We must have faith that that's happening. We have a Father. We know, we know as parents how fathers take care of kids, how they love for them, provide for them, love to hang out with them. We know that our father is greater than any human father we may have had experience with. And the last word is first. Putting God's will first in our lives and in our actions. So this chapter tells us, in the end, would you guys leave tomorrow in God's hands? while today you seek first the kingdom of God? Would you just dare to leave the future in the only one who knows the future? Leave it in his hands. And today, 
seek him first. And then we can be assured that every temporal, physical, material blessing will be taken care of. Right? So chapter 7. Judge not that you be not judged. Nobody's ever heard this before. This is brand new. Especially in our day, right? For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. The word judge here is the word crino. And I just wrote down a definition. It says crino is to distinguish, to make some kind of distinction, to decide, by implication to try, put on trial, or to punish, or to avenge, or to conclude, or condemn, or damn, or decree, or de determine again, esteem, judge, ordain, call into question. It's to sentence somebody. The word carries the idea of making a final judgment. Boom. The gavel comes down. You've decided to crino someone. You've decided to form a judgment about them. <laughs> What's interesting about that is we can only know somebody's actions. We are not like God who sees the thoughts and the intents of the heart. We don't have that inside information. We're judging someone by what we see, what we observe. That's not very smart. This verse has become greatly misunderstood in our culture. We hear it all the time. Judge not, you Christians. Boy, don't, don't you judge me. God told you, don't judge. Right out of Jesus' mouth, don't judge. Like Jesus is trying to tell us not to make any judgments at all. Don't you dare say this is right and that's wrong. Don't you dare say that's good and this is evil. Don't you dare. You know, like Jesus would say that. Isn't Jesus telling us, make right judgments? Tell me what's good and what's evil. Change your life. How do I change if I don't have a judgment about what's going on? How foolish is that? What Jesus, Jesus actually is saying here is, don't become a judgmental jerk. That's what he's saying. And we'll, we'll see that as we go through. If you become a judgmental jerk, you're going to be treated like a judgmental jerk. The world is going to look at you as one. Um, at my wife's work, <coughs> excuse me, the other day they had a customer come in and started to make certain comments to a certain employee there. And the comment was something like, man, they need to go back to flipping burgers, maybe something they were actually good at. <sighs> they were a little harsh. A little unloving, right? And all the employees, after that lady leaves the building, they're all like, I don't, I don't want to help her anymore. That was really a harsh thing to say, and I, I don't want to even be around that person. Do you see what actually happened there? Someone came in and was harsh in their judgment, and guess what kind of judgment they receive? Harsh, unloving judgment. That's exactly what this verse says. It doesn't say don't make judgments. It says be prepared. If you make stupid judgments, if you make harsh judgments, you could get a little harsh judgment in return. She had decided, she had concluded, if you can go back to those words I was using when I explained what crino is, she had decided that this employee wasn't up to her standard. And she became judge, jury, and executioner of her standard. And now she is likewise being judged and juried and executioned, you know, right there in her presence, you know, but her judgment is, I'm superior to you. My needs are superior to yours. And when we act that way, when we say those kind of things, 
That guy is dumb as a post. I know you've never heard that. I've tried to curtail that coming out of my mouth, you know. That guy's elevator doesn't go all the way to the top. Those people over there, they're trailer trash, you know. <laughs> Uneducated, fool, idiot. Pick your favorite. We all have a couple that float around, you know, at times. When we say such things, we are showing that that change that Christ brought into our life has had no foothold in our life. It has not changed our heart. We are acting like mere men of this world and not like sons and daughters of the one true God. Now Jesus is bringing this up because he's being judged. He's being placed on a judgment seat by the religious world around him. They look at Jesus and they go, I guess from Nazareth. You know, that's backwoodsy, out back. You know, this guy is from, you know, Mississippi, Alabama. Some more deep down south, you know. He's a country bumpkin, you know. He's a hayseed. He's uneducated. Hasn't gone to our system of schooling. Who, who in the world would, would choose him? He's unsophisticated. You know, a lot of the world looks at you. I know. It's pretty unsophisticated, you know. He's born out of wedlock, you know. He, he's a bastard child. There is no way. You know, he lives this kind of loose religious life. There is no way he could be the chosen one of God. Notice what they're looking at. All the externals. And half of those are wrong, but they're looking at these externals. You know, when a child is born out of wedlock, is it the child's fault? Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? And yet, we have a whole class of people that will judge you according to that. When, when someone comes up and they're uneducated, no higher learning. I almost hate that term anymore, higher learning. Is that really the kid's fault? Or could the parents not afford it? You know, were, were they just not, not good timing? What, what's going on there? When they're raised in a trailer park, is that their problem? When they're not born in our country, or when they weren't raised in New York City, or Los Angeles, you know. You know, the person's color, the person's race, the person's background, the person's city, the person's education level, their looks, all of those things are beyond that person's means. When you're looking at someone like that and you're, you're judging them, you're actually judging their creator who put them there and who made them that. How out of line is that for us kids of the king to look around and judge someone for something that God brought into their life? So verse 3, he says, and why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove that speck from your eye and look, a plank is in your own eye. <coughs> you guys know Dick, you know, he's had this problem with his eye and he finally went in and got that shot, shot right in his eye. Now, I've had a little experience with some eye issues, you know, uh, working on my old truck. I'm out there grinding away and I got a sliver in, in one of my eyes. So uh, two or three days later, you know, after it all swole up and it was red for, looked like a grape in there, you know, it was like, well, I probably better go in. And I go in and uh, 
the guy <laughs> brings up his little scope, puts it on there. Oh, yeah, I see that. And you get a little piece of rusty metal in there. And it was, it was a brand new piece of metal, but it had rusted because it was in my wet eye, you know. And he goes, oh, we have to fish that out of there for you. And I'm like, really? Fish, fish it out. He goes, it's no big deal. We just put some drops in there. We'll give you a little shot right in the eye. And then we'll go in and we'll scrape it out. And uh, all of these words, they're seemingly harsh. They, I mean, I think Jesus brings up the eye here on purpose because you want somebody, when they're coming at your eye, you want them to be very gentle. You want it to be just cotton balls and moisture and, you know, not the idea of, let's just scrape that out. Well, yeah, sign me up for that. Can we do that like every Thursday for, you know, a year? So why do we look at this piece of sawdust in somebody else's eye around us when we've got the old telephone pole? Hey, buddy, come here. You know, let me fix that for you. Yeah. My doctor, I made sure when he came in, I made sure that he had his glasses on. I want to make sure this guy's seeing clearly, right? I don't want, I don't want him to come in and have a big toothpick sticking out of his eye. Oh, I can see pretty good. It'll be all right. Which eye is it again? You know, I, I don't want any of that stuff going on. And when we want someone, when we allow someone close enough to remove something out of our tender little eye, that's pretty intimate. That's pretty close. We want nothing but love and happiness and feelings and, and soft and kind and, you know, a bunch of puffs, you know, next to us so we can dab. And We want it nice. And yet our world's running around here with plank eye, you know, two by four eye going on. And they're telling the whole world, you're an idiot because you think this and you're dumb because you grew up there. And here's these planks just flying all over the place against people that just have a little piece of sawdust in their eye. We have a fallen nature that loves to judge others severely. And then when it sees its own self in that judgment, it loves to go, yeah, but God, love, God knows my heart. You know, because we understand our own circumstances, but we don't understand theirs, and all we see is their outward action, and we think, boy, that guy's a jerk, you know? My wife and I have been watching this show about a courtroom in Sydney, Australia. And you're going through and you're hearing all these stories and you're seeing the judges and they're kind of getting to know. And I would be the hanging judge. Just hang that guy, get him out of here. Just put him away for good, you know, do this, do that. And you know, they're walking you through why, you know, courtrooms are like they are and why, you know, this, you know, Hanging them is just one little piece of the thing. There's all of these other pieces of the puzzle. And I'm like, I'm missing all of these other pieces of the puzzle. I'm missing mercy and grace and compassion and understanding where somebody's been and how hard it's been for them to get here. And, you know, going through all of that stuff. You know, God desires truth in the inward parts. He desires our inward parts to be right, our heart, our compassion. You know, you read through the, the Gospels, and it doesn't take long to, to see Jesus, you know, and they're, they're starving, and they're hungry, and they haven't had food all day, and they go to some alone place, and the whole crowd follows them, and it says Jesus looks up and has compassion on them. He loves them. He'd rather go without and make sure they go with. He says, otherwise, hypocrite, you're a hypocrite. If you've, if you've got this big judgmental attitude hanging out of your face, 
And you're looking at somebody and they just have a little speck of problem and all you can see is that little speck of problem. It's your issue. It's not theirs. You have an issue. You got to get with the great physician and get your eye fixed. Have you ever noticed that we see in others what we fail to see in ourselves? When it comes to judging people, we should spend the vast majority of our time in front of a mirror. You want to judge somebody, judge that jerk in that mirror. Just pull out your Bible, start reading just a couple of passages. You know, the easy ones. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Well, rip that page out of there. Let's move on to the next one. You know, what could be the next one? Wives, honor, respect, obey your husbands in the Lord, for this is good and acceptable. Oh, mercy. Let's change the page. Let's go somewhere else. I'm sorry. You should judge yourself. And what should be your rule of judgment? <coughs> Not the world's standard. The Word of God. This is the mirror that reflects your heart. And you use this to judge this, but don't do it harshly. Do it gracefully and carefully because you can get caught up in that thing. Self-condemnation. You're a jerk, Mark, and you're never getting any better. And, blah, 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 blah. and next thing you know, you're doing the crino thing. You've, you've condemned yourself. Don't, don't, don't go there. No, because we're still, you know, being transformed. We're still in the process. There's still stuff going on. Be honest with yourself, but be gracious with yourself because God has not finished with you yet, right? And when it comes to others, get rid of your judgmental attitude first. First thing, check your heart. Check its condition. See, I have people come to me with issues. Mark, I've got this thing going on. And it's really easy to sit there and begin to look down in judgment. It's really hard to make sure there's no judgment involved. It's really hard just to slide in there and go, yeah, I'm guilty of that too. Yeah, I understand that. I see where you're coming from there. Are you one of the people causing trouble, swinging your plank around, whacking people's heads off? Or are you someone that they trust to come in and dig out that thing out of their eye? Verse 6. Do not give what is holy to dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Now, this should get your attention. You judge not, lest you be judged people. Don't you be judging. And then he brings up a verse like this. What's holy? And what are dogs? And what are pearls? And what are swine? You ever wonder about that? Wait a minute, that takes a little... Judgment. That takes some discernment, spiritual discernment to figure that out. Jesus, again, he's teaching us how to make right judgments, not foolish judgments, not worldly judgments. If your best friend is a bad influence, it's okay to step away, make a judgment. I'm not going to go out with the boys this week, you know. If you're kid's best friend is pulling him in the wrong direction it's okay to make a judgment stand start to suggest other directions for them to go you know if your buddies want to go out carousing and drinking you may have to make a judgment call right there every day we make judgments right wrong good evil you know better best Every day. And Jesus is not saying, stop it. No, Jesus is saying, do that. But do it righteously. 
What's that idea? Don't give what's holy to dogs. You know? Are you trusting holy things to unholy people? Are you taking the offering on the altar and throwing it out to the scavenger dogs? That's no priest in the, in the Old Testament would ever do that. This is holy. It's set apart for a certain purpose, not for that. You know? What about you're casting your pearls before swine? You know, pigs have no appreciation of pearls. Oh, I can't wait to get that pearl. I'm going to put it on my nose. You know? <laughs> pigs don't, don't think that way. If it's not food, they just trample it underfoot, right? I think it's interesting that Jesus always treated people according to their <coughs> receptivity of the gospel or of the truth. Always treated people that way. He had this spiritual discernment. This person's only open to this. And so when Nicodemus comes, he says, hey, you must be born again. Boom, hit him at a spiritual high point, made Nick think, you know. But then the woman at the well in the next chapter, man, you need living water. Come to me, you who thirst. He met her right where she was. Religious rulers come to him, and guess what he does? He doesn't even speak to them at times. He meets them where they are. How does he do that? Judgment, discernment. So in verse 7, he says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and him, he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who has a son who asks for bread? Will you give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will you give him a serpent? If you then, being <laughs> evil, <coughs> know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Now we know Jesus had already given these guys a prayer outline, you know, a couple of weeks ago. But now he lets them know, God not only wants you to pray, he looks forward to you praying. He looks forward to you asking and seeking and knocking. And he is happy to answer you in those times. And in context in this passage, it seems like this passage kind of jumps off the paper, but he's not. He's saying, rather than be judgmental, he says, you should come with a prayerful attitude towards these people. You should be on your knees. Lord, let me be a blessing and not a curse. Lord, let me remove a, a speck instead of strike this guy with a plank, you know. Let me be different. It's important for us to be humble and kind and loving and graceful to this fallen world. Otherwise, there's no difference between us and it. The key thoughts in this passage are, it's all ongoing. It's ask and keep asking. It's seek and keep seeking. It's knock and keep knocking. And the promise, it will be opened, right? Ask and it will be given. Ask and keep asking, and guess what? He will give and keep giving. Knock and keep knocking, and he will open and keep opening. <laughs> Seek and keep seeking, and you will find and keep finding. It's not just clever verbiage. It's a promise of God. It's a promise. God says, you ask, keep asking. You seek and keep seeking. You knock <coughs> and keep knocking. And here's my promise. I will answer. I will be found of you. You guys consider yourself good parents, right? Your son asks for a sandwich. You know, my little granddaughter, Grandpa, I'm hungry. Do, do I walk outside, grab a stick? 
Here you go, chew on that, you know. I go get her a scorpion. There you go, sweetie. Chew away. You all, you all sit there and you think, well, that's the stupidest thing. Who would do that? That's the point. That's the point. Because what he's saying is, yet you're telling me you have asked and I haven't given. You have sought and you haven't found. You have knocked and it wasn't open. But I'm telling you, it was. How many of us think that we've asked and God has ignored? We've sought. We didn't get it our way. So this can't possibly be true. You think, you think God, the Father, the greatest Father of all, is actually giving you a stone instead of a sandwich. Mm -mm. It's not true. He's actually going to give you a serpent instead of a fish. No, it's not true. <coughs> over and over and over again through the Bible it says, My children will lack no good thing. Now, I could run through the list of do's and don'ts for prayer, right? Oh, you got to pray in his name. You got to pray according to his will. You got to pray according to his character. You got to you got to pray with faith. Cuz if you don't pray with faith, don't think you're going to receive anything. You know, all of these things. And they they're all great things. But I just got news for you. We have a father that loves us. And he will not keep any good thing from you. So if he's keeping something from you, that is not a good thing. You ever think about that? Well, how could a million dollars not be a good thing, Lord? I don't get it. That Porsche would look good in my driveway. I'd write Jesus on the side. <laughs> Jesus saves even, you know? Maybe put a verse or two on there. It's not good for you, Mark. Might be good for your neighbor. How about I give your neighbor that? No, don't do that. That wouldn't be good for me. So whether you're asking for a fish sandwich, whether you're asking for whatever it is, your father knows best. And yes, no is an answer, right? Sorry, Mark, not now, not good, not right, not for you. If you then, being evil, you ever consider yourself a better parent than God? Well, I, I always met my kids' needs. I always made sure. You, you mean God's not meeting your needs? God's not making sure. You're okay. I think he is. How much more will he do that? How much more will he give to those who ask of him? If an earthly father delights to give material to their kids, how much more will your father give spiritually and materially to you? We're to have this lifestyle of asking and seeking and knocking. It's to be not just in your five minutes of prayer. It's to be a lifestyle. As you go around, are you asking that you might be a blessing and not a curse? Are you seeking opportunity to serve and to give and to share? Are you knocking for doors to be open? It should be just an everyday lifestyle thing. He says, therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets, the golden rule. How you wish to be treated, treat others that way. If they're not nice to you, be nice to them. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say share if they share. It doesn't say care if they care. It doesn't say be friendly if they're friendly. It says, you need a friend? Then be a friend. It says, you need help? Then help. It's interesting how it's written. 
You know, Jesus in another place in, in Luke chapter 6 says it this way, Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Notice, this is what starts the cycle. When you give, when you do, that starts a cycle. What do you need or what do you desire from life? Then give that. That's the hardest thing in the world. It says give and what you gave, give and it, the very thing you gave will be given back to you. So what do you need? Lord, I, I need more money. Then give money away. Well, that makes no sense at all, Mark. That can't be God's word. That is exactly God's word. And that is exactly the point. Not foolishly, just willy-nilly give money away, but prayerfully and carefully. Lord, how can I bless somebody else? How can I do this? You need more time? Give time away. That doesn't seem to make sense, Mark. It does in the Lord's economy. We have his promise. This is how I work. God's promise is, you will never outgive me, ever. And in doing this, you're fulfilling the actual law of the prophets. God can do more with your money than you can. We all agreed on that? God can do more with your time than you can. So how come we don't trust him with it? He can do more with your abilities, with your possessions, with your talent than you can. So as you think back through this message, I, I just think about it, you know, if we worry, guess what we get back? If we give out worry, worry's coming back. That's not what you want to do, right? If we focus on material, guess what's coming back? Material focus. Don't want that. If we choose to judge others harshly, guess what's coming back? Harsh judgment coming back. If all you see is problems in other people, look at the speck in that guy's eye, and look at the plank over there, and look at this, and look at that, guess what's coming back? Specks and planks, problems. But as you begin to ask, and as you begin to seek, and as you begin to knock for these godly things, for the right attitude, for the idea that I want to be a blessing and not a curse, I want to be his hands, I want to be his feet, I want to lead, I want to guide, I want to provide, I want to do these things, guess what starts to come back? As you go through life and you see a need, then the Lord asks you, would you fill that need first? If you find yourself without close friends, guess what you need to do? Become a close friend. If you find yourself in need of depth of character, guess what you need to do? You need to give away some depth of character. If you need more peace, give peace to somebody. If you need more grace, give grace away. You know, the greatest thing you can give away is the gospel because, you know, when you give the gospel away, you know what you get? The joy of the gospel renewed in you. It's interesting. Everything you choose to give away comes back to you, but it comes back to you more and better. Press down, shaken, you know. You don't get that half bag of chips. <coughs> Even with the new little bags. We, we called those snack bags when I was a kid. And then next week, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who find it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Seems like it's out of place again, but it's not. 
Next week, the broad and the narrow way. It's all about this lesson right here today. The broad way is, though, is for those who choose to ignore Christ and his directives. This is how you build a Christian life. Give it away and it will come back. Cast your bread upon the waters and it will return. Over and over through the Bible. You hear the good news, but it, you don't enter into it. <coughs> those who don't practice the principles of the gospel they hear a sermon but they're convinced they don't really need that but the narrow way is those who hear the word and realize <coughs> sorry <coughs> that God's grace is mandatory for me I must have it that his only son died to give me a brand new life. And I'm desperate for that. And that life needs to start today. And you know how it starts today? It needs to affect and infect everything I do and everything I am. It's a path of devotion. And it's a path of service and it's a path of difficult choices because the world says don't do that and that's the direction I'm walking in the world says no you need to be selfish you want more money you need to save more and God says you need more money you need to give more that doesn't make any sense you need more love give love you need more peace give peace you need more grace give grace that's a difficult and a narrow path. But it's the path, if you read the, read the directions here, it says, that's the path which leads to life. It doesn't just lead to heaven. It leads to life. Do you want to live? Do you want to have life? That's the path. Give it away. And it comes back. Father, as we think about these things worry judgmental attitude asking and prayer seeking your face <clears throat> lord there's there's much work to be done in our lives father we just pray lord that your holy spirit would come would plow up these hard hearts this hard ground and allow us to, to put out and to plant those first seeds of trust and of faith and of belief. God, that we would truly know and truly believe that we have a Father that so loves us. That of all our natural things, they would, they would be taken care of because we simply seek your kingdom and your righteousness and lord we want to put it first so god draw and awaken and lead us down that narrow difficult way in jesus name we pray amen